Thank you, David, and congratulations on a spectacular career, and thank you for your support of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Our second presenter this evening is Terry McGuire. Terry is the co-founder and general partner of Polaris Venture Partners, focused specifically on life sciences investments. Terry also represents Polaris on the boards of many drug development companies and is chairman emeritus of the National Venture Capital Association and chairman of the Global Venture Capital Congress. Terry sits on the boards of many academic institutions, including the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College, MIT's David Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, and the Arthur Rock Center for Entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School. Terry was listed in Forbes Midas 100 list, top tech investors for 2011, and is a recipient of the Albert Einstein Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Life Sciences. Won't you please join me in welcoming Terry McGuire. So it's a, uh, it's a true pleasure to present this award this evening to, uh, to Bob Langer. As Alan referenced earlier, I've known Bob really for the last 20 years. Uh, and in fact, we started over a dozen companies together. Uh, so to say that I know him well is uh, sort of an understatement. And so I was trying to port find a way to portray Bob to this audience. There's many people in this room that know him well and others that don't. And so I thought I'd look at a couple different dimensions. Uh, and one dimension was to simply start with the numbers. And, and Alan referenced some of this earlier. Consider a researcher who, still in the prime of his career, has already 800 patents in the medical space, probably making him the most prolific medical inventor in history. Um, 100, uh, I'm sorry, 1,200 uh, publications resulting in 80,000 or 84,000 citations, which is enormous. Uh, Bob, as was referenced, has started 25 companies. And if you consider the 250 companies that have taken technology out of Bob's lab, uh, they represent revenues of approximately $1 billion this year. So others will know Bob by the accomplishments. Uh, MIT Institute professor, a member of all three national academies, arts and science, engineering and medicine. Uh, he has over 220 awards, including the Draper Prize, the Millennium Prize, the Priestley Medal, the Wolf Prize in Chemistry, the Albany Medical Prize, the Gardner Prize, and the Lemelson MIT Prize. And on top of that, he has 20 honorary degrees from places like Yale and Harvard. My favorite here is that, uh, and I've had others describe Bob as a national treasure. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting, President Barack Obama and George Bush didn't agree on many things, but one of the things they did agree on was Bob. Uh, <laughs> So in 2007, uh, George Bush presented Bob with the National Medal of Science. And in February of this year, President Barack Obama presented Bob with the Na National Medal of Innovation and Technology, making him one of only six people who have ever received both of these awards. Yet still, there's people that know Bob as a mentor. And in fact, it's striking that 600 people have gone through Langer Lab. Uh, and approximately 40 have gone on to faculty positions at great universities like Harvard and Stanford and Yale and and Hopkins, and of course, MIT, and Cornell, Bob's alma maters. 10% um, have gone on to clinical medicine uh, and to best teaching hospitals. Uh, approximately 20% have gone in the industry with great companies like Pfizer and Merck and Vertex and Biogen and others. And then about 30% have gone on to start companies, including companies that we've backed, like Air and Alnylam and Alchemies and Momenta. And then a very few people have gone on to become venture capitalists. And in fact, two of our partners, Amir Nashat and Paulina Hill came out of Bob's lab. So you will know Bob as a pioneer. His intellectual determination has really changed the face of medicine. Uh, I think it's changed the practice of, of engineering and the paradigms of research. Uh, but more than that, for me, as, an, as a venture capitalist, he's become the model of the uh, modern academic entrepreneur. Uh, his work has contributed to the full spectrum of human health, including in areas of cancer, infectious disease, heart disease, diabetes, and of course, the loss of sight and blindness. We, we tried to, at Polaris one time, we tried to calculate the impact that Langer's portfolio would have on the world, the potential portfolio. Not all these products are approved yet, but if you measure the disease states that the Langer portfolio is going after, it, it measures up to 2.5 billion people one day could be touched by a Langer technology, which is just a striking example of, of research. 
one other thing that's striking about Bob, I think anyone who knows Bob realizes that uh, while he has all these accomplishments, he's probably the nicest and humblest person in the world. Uh, he's famous for responding to emails in five minutes, and I was going to challenge people to see whether he would do that or not, but of course, I think that would be fair right now. But uh, he's just been a remarkable guy. But I think for Bob, there's another set of people uh, that are more, if not more, important than him, and there are people that he'll never meet. These are the patients and families that will live uh, with, with therapies that have been generated by Langer Lab and Langer, technology, or Langer uh, startups. For example, there's millions of p p uh, patients today who are suffering from macular degeneration that will benefit from inhibitors of angiogenesis, such as Lucentis. And some of that work was done in Judah Folkman's lab, Dr. Folkman's lab, back in the 70s, and Bob was a collaborator then. So Bob's contribution to treating blindness has really been early in his career, and it's continued on. Uh, we've started a number of companies, including Kala and Microchips and other companies which are targeting biomaterials and electronics in cellular therapy and other ways to uh, treat blindness. And so uh, I think we can have a real impact, and particularly Bob can have a real impact on the state of, uh, of blindness and the treatments for it. So that's why tonight's recognition of Bob for me is so poignant. Uh, the Foundation Fighting Blindness has committed itself to uh, the high, uh, having a huge impact on improving patients' lives. It currently sponsors six innovative programs in translational research costing millions of dollars. And like Bob, the research that you do is not limited to one modality or another. It really is gene therapy, drugs, cellular trans uh, transplantation, and are all being explored for cures, and so it's very exciting. So tonight, uh, I am, tonight is a night to recognize visionary research, and so I think it is very fitting that the foundation has chosen to recognize the work of Professor Robert Langer. It's my great pleasure to present the Bob the Visionary Award. So please join me in honoring Bob for his significant contributions. <laughs> Terry, thank you so much, and thank all of you for honoring me with this wonderful award. Um, and I, I feel also very privileged to share this with David, and I think as I go through some of what I was going to go through as I talk about this tonight, I think there's an enormous synergy in what we've both done. I thought what I'd try to do is tell you a little bit about our research and how I got involved in, in, in this area, but it goes many, many years ago. Uh, so I, uh, I got my uh, doctorate degree from MIT in 1974, and I was a chemical engineer. For those of you that were around even in 1974, you might remember, like just like a few years ago, there was this uh, kind of gas shortage, and the uh, prices of gas kept going up. But not only that, if you lived in Boston, what I remember is when you, I took my car to the gas station, I not only had to pay a lot of money, I had to wait in line for two hours to get my tank filled up. But the consequence of that is if you were a young chemical engineer like I was, you got, is you got a lot of job offers. And, I, and pretty much every one of my classmates at MIT in 1974 went into the oil industry. And I thought that's probably what I should do too, so I interviewed in the oil industry. I actually got 20 job offers. Four, actually, from Exxon alone. <laughs> and, and it wasn't like I was that great or anything. But um, one, of, one of them made quite an impression on me. I remember going to Exxon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and one of the chemical engineers, he went to MIT about eight years before I did, you know, he was trying to sell me on Exxon. He said, you know, if you could just increase the yield of this one petrochemical by 0.1%, he said, that would be fantastic. He said, it's worth billions of dollars. And I remember flying home to Boston that night thinking to myself that I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> so, so I started, and it really was very important to me. I started thinking, what did I want to do? You know, so one of the things that I, I did when I was a graduate student, when I was supposed to be doing my thesis, is I spent a lot of time starting the school for poor children in Cambridge. And I spent a lot of time developing new math curriculum and chemistry curriculum. And one of the, well, that's, uh, so one, one, one day I actually saw an ad in a journal uh, advertising at City College of New York to be assistant professor, 
there developing chemistry curriculum. And I thought to myself, that's great, that's what I want to do, and I wrote them a letter. But they uh, didn't write me back. <laughs> but I really liked the idea, so I, I uh, wrote to all the colleges that, uh, probably about 40 in the United States that had openings in this area uh, for, for such a position. And actually, none, none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so, so that wasn't going so well. So I started thinking, what are some other ways I could use my education in chemical engineering to help people? So I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools, and, and, and they didn't write back either. But one day, one of the uh, postdocs in the lab where I was at MIT said to me, he said, Bob, he said, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> he, he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. So, um, so Dr. Folkman was kind enough to offer me a job there. And this was 1974. And so I began working on two projects. I mean, the main project, actually, in 1974, as maybe people remember, Dr. Folkman had this theory that actually was very controversial. People didn't believe it. And his theory was that if you could stop blood vessels, maybe you could stop cancer, maybe you could stop other diseases. And so my project, actually, my postdoctoral project, was to see if I could actually, actually isolate the very first substance that could stop blood vessels from growing in the body. Tied to that, though, is to do that, and this is actually, when you look at the history of medicine, always very key, is you have to have a bioassay to do that, a way of studying it. This has, from penicillin on, been critical to any kind of medical discovery, and there were no assays for studying how blood vessels grew. So what we started doing was looking actually at an assay, developing an assay in the eye of a rabbit, uh, where you could put a tumor in, which would cause over an eight-week period blood vessels to grow. But the challenge was, is all these substances that we were isolating to stop blood vessels from growing were fairly large molecules. And no one had ever developed a, a way to deliver them in the eye that didn't cause inflammation, and that could deliver these large molecules in a bioactive form. And in fact, if you looked at the scientific literature in the 1970s, uh, people actually had written articles on this, basically saying it was impossible. Now, the only thing, really, that I had going for me is, is I hadn't read those articles. <laughs> so I, uh, I spent about two years working on this, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. But finally, I made the discovery that I could modify certain types of polymers and use them to release almost any molecule of any size. And that enabled us to create uh, these bioassays. And by using this, actually, we published two papers, one in Nature in 1976, showing for the first time that you could release molecules of any size, and the other in Science, also in 1976, which was the first discovery that actually angiogenesis inhibitors did exist, and showing that you could take uh, to isolate substances that could stop blood vessels from growing. I should point out, although maybe it was clear from David's talk, that it took another 28 years from that discovery that we published in science till the FDA approved the first inhibitor of blood vessels. And really, that would not have happened without people like David and people like Genentech, Tony Adamus, and many others uh, doing enormously terrific work. Um, uh, in, in terms of that, and, and really many billions of dollars that came from venture capital and corporate partners and things like that. I should point out also, though, just again to go back to the 1970s when I started doing this, uh, how this work was received scientifically. I remember in 1976 giving the first time, I got asked to give a talk at a major scientific meeting um, in Midland, Michigan, and I'd never given a big talk before. Well, actually, though, I did once in eighth grade. <laughs> but that didn't go real well. In eighth grade, I remember getting asked to give this uh, minute and a half talk, and I rehearsed it in front of my parents' mirror the night before for about four hours, over and over again. And then the next day, I uh, got up uh, and I gave the talk to my eighth grade class. And actually, for the first minute and two seconds, I, I did all right. But then, I stood up in front of the class, and I could not remember the next word. And I stood up there for another minute, absolutely frozen, until my eighth grade teacher finally told me to sit down and gave me a not particularly good grade. I, I think it was an F. So at any rate, what happened is that, that always got me very scared of public speaking. By the way, I'm going to try to not do that tonight. 
But uh, I, I see I brought this up with me. But um, so at any rate, um, now this talk came in 1976. You know, I was quite a bit older then. I was 26, I think. And I uh, practiced the talk for a couple of weeks uh, in front of a tape recorder. It was before VCRs. So I was giving this talk to a group of very distinguished older chemists and engineers about what we had done on angiogenesis and controlled release. And actually, this time, many years later, uh, in 1976, I, I felt I did all right. It was a 20-minute talk, and I didn't stammer too much. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say. And I thought when I was done that all these older scientists being nice people <laughs> would want to encourage me, this young guy. And when I got done, a whole bunch of them came up to me, and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> I, I, I should say I've experienced that quite a few times in my life. Uh, but over the years, um, you know, people repeated it, and eventually we figured out what was going on, and, and today these principles are very widely used. In fact, as we just heard, angiogenesis inhibitors are incredibly widely used in treating macular degeneration, and the controlled release systems are used in all forms of medicine, including various eye diseases for delivering drugs for long periods of time. Over the years, I also got other ideas. I remember in 1983, I talked to Jay Vacanti, he's head of uh, pediatric surgery at Mass General, and he and I came up with this idea of using combining polymers and cells to create new tissues and organs, which actually would lead to the field of tissue engineering. That wasn't real, what received real well either. Uh, a lot of scientists were very skeptical. But today, through companies like uh, at, at ACT and others, we're seeing treatments like that again being used to, to, to treat blindness. So the other thing I guess I should say, and Terry kind of mentioned this, and people that know me know this, but I, I did this academic work, and I'm a, still a professor today, and I love it. But I probably spent the first 12 years of my career at Harvard and MIT doing research and publishing papers. But one thing that was really frustrating to me was that as I'd write these papers, I just assumed if I'd write them, people would read them and people would use them. But they didn't. You know, and what I began to learn is if you're not a champion yourself, if you don't try to take these things out of the lab and create products, nobody else is going to, or at least it happens very rarely. So I decided myself that the way to do that would be to write patents and to create companies. And we've done that over and over again, actually with the help of a number of people like Terry and, and Mark Levin and other people who are here tonight. And uh, that they've been, it would not have happened without all of those kinds of investments. But through that, wonderful companies have started. Companies like Kala Pharmaceuticals, who's here tonight, who are coming up with new ways to treat, deliver drugs to treat blindness, um, and, and, and many others. And so I, I feel incredibly grateful that I've had the opportunity to um, have an academic life to try to try to make some of these findings. Um, I also feel, again, as an academic, that what you're doing, that the Society for Blind, Fighting Blindness, is incredibly important. Today in academics, and I'm still an academic, trying to get funding is harder than ever. Uh, right now, I think the pay lines from the National Institutes of Health are something like six or seven percent. Very, very hard for young people to get grants. So the fact that this is, you know, the fact that you're going out and giving grants just enables people to do things that they're probably never going to be able to do otherwise. I hope that that will lead to new treatments, maybe new companies and new products, and will certainly make this a better world, one where we can see better and do better things. Again, I'm incredibly privileged to get this award, to have the opportunity to share it with someone like David, who's done so much and to be with you all of you tonight. Thank you so much for honoring me.